What's up? We're going to talk about some data visualization. Visualization. Data visualization, which is part of visual communication. Um, the intent is to basically communicate some information clearly and efficiently. So let's start by defining data. Data is a set of qualitative or quantitative values. So facts and figures based on qualitative and quantitative values. That's it. They don't really speak for anything. They're just, they're like variables. They're just there. They need some sort of explanation around them. So what we need to do is take off that analysis hat that got us this data and we need to put on the storyteller hat. So when we do this, we don't want to just run off with all the information and say, hey, blah, 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 blah. Here's a bunch of ugly charts and stuff like that. You want it to be compelling. You want to keep people's interest. Um, you want to do a better job at that than I'm doing right now for you. You know, think about how boring, what would you do right now to, to keep somebody interested staring at one stupid slide and ready for the next one or whatever? How would you build that up? So that's, of course, going to be different for whatever the situation is, whatever your audience is. But you want to walk them through that. And you want to walk them through one little piece at a time, just like some Dateline story. Or just think of those things that really capture your attention and string you along. That's kind of what you want to do with these people. Walk them through this stuff. Let them know how you came to that conclusion or whatever conclusion you're going to come to. Because it's supposed to be based on fact. You can't just say it because then it doesn't seem to be based on fact. It doesn't seem to be backed by the data. But you also can't just throw the data out there because right now data is everywhere, right? All the answers to all the data we ever need to know, basically, more or less, is out there. We just can't see it. We can't visualize it. So we're trying to complete that process. And as we go about this, we don't necessarily have to be perfect either. Like the mistakes we make along the way, we can lead people through those mistakes as well because that shows them the reality of it. They may want to see that wall. They may want to be like, why didn't you go left instead of right there? You know, everybody goes left there or I feel that feels natural to me. So you take them down that left turn and you show them the wall and let them think about it. You know, let them process it. Ask them what what do they want to do now? What, sh you know, whatever, just let them sort of like interrogate them about it. Put it, put the ball in their court. And that way it's not just you saying those things like I'm doing right now. I'm I'm preaching right now. That's not what you want to do with a data presentation necessarily. So um, I'm going to get to some slides that show some examples. They're not much better looking than this one, but I think they serve to show the point that um, it's not about the tools. It's not even about the slides and the data itself, really. It is about the story. Um, Tools like PowerPoint and Excel, they can easily steer you wrong. The default charts are meant to have that that shiny appeal to them. They're, they're meant to capture that shiny object syndrome. They're not meant to um, necessarily give you this one-size-fits-all thing, you know. That, that takes tailoring. There's, I have yet to see an out-of-the-box solution, and I know after watching a lot of and listening to a lot of other data analysts and visualizers that none of them are happy with it either so anyway all that aside um it, it, so it's basically it's you're you want to get to that data but just like i'm doing right now you don't want to you don't want to show any more of that data than than is absolutely necessary but at the same time you do need to show something. So I don't have good examples of that, of the full-fledged product, because it would just take too much work right now. Um, I was going to try and do that, but I decided just to let you use your imagination mostly. I do have some examples that should help with um, some of the core aspects. But the thing is to keep it simple and use an enticing headline. Put something across the top that's just really going to grab the person almost like a like maybe almost like a magazine type of headline or something and there's details like if you're willing to go study a little bit of typography take some online courses or something watch some youtube videos whatever do it you know because 
it's not overly complicated to get some of the basics down. And once you find somebody who's able to like really throw some good info at you, then um, you'll you'll just make huge strides with your presentations. And I'm somebody definitely um, listen, do as I say, not as I do. But with the type you wanted to use a a plain font, a big, bold, plain font that's spaced. You don't want the font squeezed together. You want to picture everything from far away, somebody with bad vision who forgot their glasses kind of thing. Like, try and make everything so that it works for everybody. Um, and sort of a parallel to that is be able to tell the story without the slides or the graphics as well. Um, if you can't do that, that's sort of like, that's that's a warning sign that maybe this data would be better as just a report or something like that. Like, why why are you presenting, you know, just a bunch of charts or something that can just be a handout? So you should be able to basically talk through it, you know? That's what they say about any sort of uh, type of a presentation, especially PowerPoint presentations, is be prepared for the electronics to fail and be prepared to give a worthy presentation either way so that that definitely applies for this too that you know not only in that situation but the fact that like what i'm do, trying to do right now is just to basically just convey this information to you you know in a normal human sense um so now I have a definition of story here that is story puts the data in context and gives it meaning. So like I said, you know, data doesn't, it's just a bunch of facts, figures, numbers, whatever. So if I just tell you the number 52, what does that mean? I mean, you start doing all this whatever OCD stuff in your head with it maybe or something, but, or maybe that's how old you or some relative or friend is or something, you know, but you really, of course, 52 is just totally ambiguous, right? Okay, let me add a little qualifier to that. 52 rabbits. Does that mean anything? I mean, now you, at least you know what's there, but um, 52 rabbits being chased by a bear. So now we actually have, like, a situation where, you know, before it was just, like, this sort of stagnant state, this static state of, like, you know, a number of rabbits, like, we don't know if they're sitting there, if they're alive, if they're fake or anything. Now we know they're being chased by a bear. So we have a problem, we have a situation, we have an issue. And if you think of that as, like, um, your data, like, whatever thing that you're trying to bring out about it as something along those lines to where that starts putting it into context. So if you, say, want to know why... Uh, I had a good example of this earlier. I'm forgetting it now. Um, you basically, you can figure out what the, the proper solution might be. If you're worried about, like, why are these rabbits missing or something like that, right? You know that if you can get the bear to stop chasing them and if you can get those rabbits back, that will solve the problem. So by me telling you 52 rabbits being chased by a bear, you care about rabbits. You're probably vaguely familiar with rabbits if you're, listening to my presentation and uh you come to your own conclusion in your head i don't have to by the time i tell you let's uh let's get that bear away from those rabbits you're probably going to be all for it you know i don't have uh, there's no convincing left to be done the convincing was done in the storytelling manner instead of we have 52 rabbits being chased by a bear let's be very reactionary to it now you know so it it sets it up and it just it helps people go through it it's like the courts of law they usually try and hold people to a quote unquote reasonable person standard so you're basically letting them be the reasonable person and use their own judgment that can go a long way so you want to show the facts and ask them questions so show them the rabbits and the bear and then ask them what do we do about this don't tell them we need to get rid of the bear or lock the bear up or anything like that just present the information and give them some time to think about it and really just you know it's one of those moments to just pause and like let that like silence just set in so 
another really important thing to do is always to maintain context, like it's the thesis of an essay, so to speak. Um, that goes back to that last point again, is that we always want to come back to putting the data, wrapping the data in, in, in the story, basically. Put it in the story, the story gives it context. Always do that, always relate that data to that context. Be consistent with your alignment and your style. You don't want your text bouncing around on slides. You don't want to have one color scheme for this chart and another one for that chart, whatever. It probably goes without saying, but if you're anything like me, you need those kind of reminders. And then another thing to be considered about is um, images and coloring, because those can beautify slides, and at the same time, they can completely uglify them. So that's where probably the most taste is required. You don't want to fall for those default color schemes, of course. Um, keep it simple, just a few colors, like fours pushing it for sure. So use your brand colors if that's applicable. applicable um, and desaturate everything. Push everything down to those dimmer, more grayscale-ish colors. And uh, except for important things, you know, you can leave those highlighted or pop them out or whatever. Try and keep that data representation accurate. But um, our eyes generally draw towards heat and hot colors like like this yellow right here or red, pink. Colors in that spectrum, but of course, colorblind issues are definitely something worth looking into as well. Um, we're going to draw towards those colors. So if I had a thousand dark blue balls on this screen and one little bright yellow one, I'm sure you could guess without me even showing you which one your eye would probably draw to first. So that's another interesting study to do is to see how we perceive those colors. But if you just keep in mind, like the, the orangish colors are going to be good for that heat thing to draw people right to it. And then do the, the uh, secondary and tertiary stuff and more of the cool shades of the blues and the darker colors and stuff. Um, Place your details in your chart, not around it. Don't use a legend. Pit, pit the words right where they go. I'm going to get to some examples really quick here that are going to show that um, visualizing data doesn't mean reading it. So don't put up a slide, all this I'm getting into. Don't put up a slide that uh, and, and just read the slide. That's horrible. We all know that. Volume is how we, we see scale. So that's another really important thing is to use filled in um, objects like bars don't use hollow ones and keep them consistent like they that volume is so key it can so easily throw somebody off so is there anything else on here and of course um, good reminder is to always ensure that your data is accurate go back double check it everything you know um, check your representations of it make sure that nothing funky is happening because you really you just don't want to go present bad data and build up the slides as you're speaking too so you don't necessarily want to present all the information at once you want to you know I'm sure you've seen a lot of presentations like that where it starts out and it just sort of like pits the top statement on there and then the person speaks for a minute and then they pits another statement and so on maybe up to like five statements or whatever on a slide that's one way of going about it and you can use bolding and desaturation to sort of like draw the person to the next statement and away from the previous statements while still leaving that information available for them to view um, lost my place here in my little notes and then zoom into the fine details. So if you have a, you can show a big ugly chart if you want to, but just show it for a minute. Don't let anybody get alarmed and then zoom into it. Like literally like Photoshop out a piece of it or whatever you want to do. I use the GIMP. I don't like saying Photoshop, but anyway, um, do that and then break that up, break that chart up, or even build up that chart on the screen. Like if you've got a bar chart with like 10 different companies on it with maybe even multiple bars per company or something, like build that up one company at a time and just okay, 
now I think I'm finally at the part where I have a couple slides that line up. So, margin. This is just, I left this on my slides. These are just all ghetto slides made in Windows Paint. Um, maybe thrown in GIMP on a couple of them to do whatever, but they're just, they're really crude. So bear with me. But this uh, this blue line is just represents the margin. When you're developing your slides, of course, you probably familiar, you would have a margin, set a margin if you don't. And that's, you want to keep your textual content within that margin. You can let certain visual elements go beyond that, but um, you want to make sure all of your text and charts and stuff are within that. This is a, I just put this here as a bad example. Um, ironically, it's from a company that is all about infographics, and it's from a training video on Linda, which, by the way, that's where like a bunch of this data, I just did a bunch of research and used a lot of Linda videos or like three Linda courses, including other sources of information to come up with this. So um, you can look at my whatever, my LinkedIn profile and whatever videos, whatever certs I have in there from Linda for August of 2019 are basically expand on all of this information. I'm telling you, and these guys are really good. But um, anyway, this, this does a bunch of things horribly wrong. Like what they call this is this is basically your notes decorated because you can see right here there's like some squiggly lines some like drop shadow some stuff going on around it this little uh, bottom bar all that stuff to where it honestly I mean yeah it makes these boring looking notes look like okay we did something but it's really distracting you if you think about it. if you watch these kind of things and like consciously think about what you're thinking about as you're watching it, which if you watch these videos on Linda, you will do, um, then you, it's, it's a trip because you, you start realizing how much energy is wasted on all of this other stuff. And then when you look at these words, this is bullet points, which are frowned upon by anybody who really does know about visual communication design, which wouldn't be me, but, um, they, they don't even use bullet points which, I mean, this is a situation where, like, this is what bullet points were invented for. Those are bad enough, and then they're not even being used where they should. The words are all caps, and they're squeezed together, so it's hard to read. Um, I don't know if I just smoke too much cannabis or if I'm partially dyslexic or what, but I just, like, I, for, I cannot, I have never read this entire slide. Like, anyway, what the trick here is is just break everything down into its own little thing. You know what I mean? We're going to learn about, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to learn about data viz mistakes. We're going to learn how to properly visualize data, learn how to da da da. So just say, here's what we're going to do today. Bam, next slide. Learn about data viz mistakes to avoid. Then we can all think about that one thing. It can be big, legible, pretty obvious in hindsight, right? Okay. And so here's a slide I made that is the case in point for avoiding, <laughs> avoiding bullet points. And so I just went ahead and put the info right on the slide so that you can read it and kind of do that thing where you think about it as you're reading it, you know, avoid using bullet points. Since each bullet point is a point, make it one. If you want to keep multiple points, then just build up the slide as you go. As you can see, if you're trying to read along with me, you're either like going into your own world reading or you're listening to me and just sort of like looking at this slide is like a little bit too much technical weight right now for you to want to deal with. And, uh, Either way, it's taxing, and either way, only half of the information is getting through. So that's obviously not a good thing. So what you want to do is break this all up into multiple points, multiple individual slides. So right here, this is just for that first one, avoid using bullet points. Boom, avoid using bullet points. Of course, it's totally corny and cheesy or whatever, but it's to prove the point of like, hey, pit up right there. There's no question about what we're talking about. It's in your face. The data's there, you know, what would be maybe a chart or a graph or even another, just an image to make people laugh or whatever. Right there, boom, in your face, you know. So you can see, and I actually desaturated this photo. It was really, I was just some random photo off, I punched in mullet, you know, on the image search and it was a little bit too bright. So I just went ahead and that's where I used the GIMP and I just desaturate just a little bit, you know, um, probably not the best example to show that. And then what was the next one? Since each bullet is point, make it one. So boom, make each point. 
bam, there it is. So that just should be driving that home, like whatever this point might be on this slide or whatever. But don't use pure colors like this. Those are not desaturated colors. So they're a little bit bright. They're not fitting. Like I don't really have a scheme for them to clash against, but anyway, you want to desaturate them like that. Lean towards that grayscale. See the difference? There's the pure color. There's the desaturated. And here's the good old pie chart. This course made by me in paint in like five minutes. Um, not a good idea. I, you can sketch your own charts. I mean, don't be scared to get creative or do whatever you want. Some people recommend doing that before you even try and like hone out the finished product. But um, I, I think this, this paints the picture without, you know, you can't tell what's, who's, Who's doing better or worse, Amazon or Acme Inc. down here at the bottom? You know, like, it's really hard to tell which one of those is better. And then it's like, there's just so much detail around this thing. By the time you get around, it's like, which thing's which, you know? Like, so if you really do care about the individualities, the pie charts are really only good for showing, like, a big difference. So if Acme was taking up, like, half this pie chart and everybody else was over here, then I could say, you know, like, whatever, Acme's taking or losing the lead or whatever. So here's the same idea in a bar chart form, which you should always favor is that bar chart. And you can instantly see which one's doing better. The, these don't line up with the last slide, but, you know, uh, if they did. So you can instantly see X is beating everybody. Um, you can tell which bar belongs to everybody because the information is right there. That's what I meant about putting the information right in context, right with the stuff. You know, don't pull it out. And only put the information that's necessary. You don't need all of this to necessarily know that X is doing better than Google. That's a relative thing, right? Or maybe not necessarily better. Maybe that's their cost for a quarter or something. But but if you do, I mean, these are here. They're there so that if somebody does want that reference, it's there. One thing I try to do is use, like, more uh, rounded off pretty numbers. And I didn't include every single. I didn't go 900, 800, 700, 600. I skipped. You know, you just... This is probably, you know, arguably maybe even a little bit too much, but I think it's good enough. It's not too much, not too little, so that somebody can still look over there and get the reference. But this still isn't uh, honing in. It's not simple enough. We're still just throwing a chart out there, you know. Yeah, I'm talking around it or whatever, and it's trying to put it into some context, but we really just, we can't, that's too much work. We want to we have the person's attention. We have their eyeballs, almost like a set of virtual reality glasses right now. So, bam, just focus that attention. We want to talk about X. Look where X is at. Lead your eye right to it. That's popping. That's hotter, you know, with even using a cool color because everything else is desaturated. Like I said, again, I did this in paint, so I just came back in with a bucket fill tool and grayed everything out. So that's why there's all this crud around the outside edge. That's not really ideal you probably just want to totally grayscale them out but anyway but yeah and then you can see like don't be afraid to just you know as long as you don't feel like you're invading the slide just put in the information that's key highlight it and lead the eye and tell that story as you lead so here's a real world data example go to the actual web page it's on so here's a data visualization dashboard on LinkedIn. And this is your uh, your social selling index dashboard. And it's a bunch of arbitrary vanity metrics that aren't actionable, but whatever. It's a good example of a dashboard. Um, right here you have two things that I suppose some people care about. But right there at the top, it tells you what your ranks are right off the bat. So that information is pushed to the top. Then you come down here and you have this donut graph that's kind of like a bar chart if you think about it, but we really don't care what each one of these individual things is right at this moment. If we do, we can come over here and we can sort of go, oh, orange, that's my professional brand establishment. Okay. And we can make that connection, but it's not something we're going to be doing the whole time. I'm talking about like, oh my God, how much of that is taking up that chart, you know? So... Over here, we can see it in comparison with that bar chart style. That's a little annoying. Um, 
you know, it's just a horizontal bar chart, so we can still see instantly the comparison of everything against itself. In all honesty, I think this last metric's like binary because it's either zero or full whenever <laughs> I've never seen it in between. Um, but yeah, and then some other little minutia to pay attention to here is they have these values right in here. Like the min and max are right there against each little bar. But it's not too much information. It doesn't, it's not overwhelming. They could have put a box around it and put a zero and a uh, whatever, half a 25 and, you know. Uh, so, yeah, this is interactive. I, I don't think this is a good example of, like, what you would want to do interactive. I uh, That's annoying right there to me. Maybe put, like, a box somewhere else. I've... I know they don't do that because of small screen sizes and they don't know if you'll see it, but anyway, it's just annoying. Also, here's more, obviously, interactive stuff where you can just hover and see that exact amount at a glance. And then right here, this 70 is telling you, if that 70 wasn't there, you wouldn't know. It's like, oh, is that, what is that, 65%? I don't know. So it's right there, 70 out of 100, which is 70%. Really good example of a basic line chart right here is... Of course, you should be favoring the bars. I don't know if I said it. You should favor bars first. Only use, this isn't a real pie chart. This is different. But if it was a pie chart, you'd only want to use the, the pie chart to show the major differences. And then a line chart when you're going over a time period usually is a, a good uh, trigger to say, hey, I, I want to do a line chart. So what we have here on this line chart, very nicely designed, even though it looks so stupid and mundane. Um, I don't know like what significance these values actually have and I don't really even care honestly. Um, I guess it's this stuff just plotted out over time. Same information so it's another way to view that data. And what's going on here though if we look at the styling of it I think is very important. For one thing it's interactive and the interactiveness isn't too annoying which is nice. It's probably maybe more helpful showing a percentage of change and that exact number. Um, the other thing is these horizontal lines, you can see they're desaturated, but they're there. So you don't have to be over here wondering like, oh, where's this? And like, keep trying to draw your, can you imagine without this fill and without these lines, like, or even without this continuous line between each one of these points. So all that is helping to make that really easy. Boom. You can, it's so easy to do. Right. And then also this fill in here, this is this could even be a grayscale fill or whatever you want to do it. They've done it really nice and sort of matched. It looks like maybe a branding color or this color or something. I don't know. A little bit different. Okay, but yeah, it fills in and it just, it represents, it goes back to that volume thing where we look at that area, that volume that's consumed and it, it pits things into perspective, you know. This isn't how much is missing, this how much is there or something like that. And then down here, this is uh, getting into more detail around uh, this stuff right here. But instead of looking at your specific stats and how it relates to this, it's relating your stats against your network and your industry. So I'm assuming your industry would be like everybody on LinkedIn if you're a software developer that has that box checked or whatever. And then the people in your network might be artists or whatever else. and you're still going to get compared to them in this metric. Um, these actually bring up a few good, I mean, we've already explained all this and what's going on, but right here you've got bolding. This That's a really simple thing you can do with just, if you do have a line of text, this is a little bit wordy right here, but hey, it's LinkedIn, whatever, you know. Um, bolding, and then this right here, hot, draws your eye to it right away, right? And we usually get excited about red, green's a little bit more calm, and that's the one for going up. Um, on a political note, I think this is just stupid, like, <laughs> give me a break. And then this one's grayed out, desaturated, pushed to the back. Um, they don't think changed important is necessarily important information to anybody or whatever, I guess, so that's cool. So let me double check my notes. I thought I wouldn't even go five minutes with this video, but... I seem to always go forever. Experiment with multiple visualizations. 
Less is more show exactly what's needed. Lean towards monochromatic or even black and white color styles. Monochromatic is, think of like grayscale, but with one particular color, like purple, all the way from almost white to almost black, shades of it. Um, keep it simple. Like, keep it as simple as possible. Of course, know your audience. Your audience probably isn't data analysts, so keep it really simple. You know, give it that executive summary kind of a tone, if even that. And uh, be creative, but don't be too creative. You can do, like, say you're doing a pie chart, and the pie chart's about, like, some brand of cookies uh, hitting some market and, like, how much they've expanded. You could use a cookie, you know, you could literally use a cookie with a bite taken out of it or something cool like that. But just make sure that that it's an accurate representation of that data and that it doesn't distract or anything like that. The same thing goes with like liberties with like being creative with colors and fonts and stuff like that. If you're just going to do like a title slide or just something like BAM or something like that, you can use some whacked font and not follow like all these tight guidelines and stuff like that but when it comes back to like general readability and stuff like that and you know just going through the the cycles of the presentation you want to make sure and keep people engaged do just do better than i'm doing right now anyway that's all i got thanks a lot